Hey, welcome all my friends in the automotive aftermarket, great leaders, shop owners, and friends. It's Carm Capriato, the aftermarket podcast pioneer. Good to have you all here. It's a Friday, episode 235 of the Town Hall Academy, and we are talking creating a training culture. i got a great team. It's going to be so much fun, and uh, got some really good things to talk to you about now. We're you. We are coming to you live. I, I I don't. I talk for a living, don't I? We're coming to you live from the Remarkable Results Radio Podcast Studio, and uh, I got a great panel here with me. Let me introduce him to you, Dave Shadeen, Computech Automotive Management Systems since 2006, 40 plus years of experience in the automotive field. Dave has extensive GM University Automotive and Business Management training and is a graduate of the Arizona Automotive Institute. Dave, how are you, man? I'm doing well. <laughs> um, thanks again for having me back. And I love these oh. podcasts and what you do for our industry. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, Dave, just go to my website, type in Dave Shadin, S-C-H-E-D-I-N, and, and marvel at these uh, the episodes that we've done. Brand new to the podcast is Brian Holthy, from Genesis Automotive and RV in Tacoma, Washington. He's also the Pierce County ASA chapter president. Hey, Brian, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you here. We're talking we're talking culture, everyone. Uh, if you're with us on social media, please uh, check in with your city. Give us a like, a comment, or a share. That would be so nice if that happens. And don't forget, we come to you live each and every Friday at 12 noon Eastern. We repurpose this as a podcast. Next Thursday, it will come out on your favorite podcast listening app uh be on the be a fly on the wall that's what we want you to do bury yourself in this discussion learn something new and next time you're in one of your networking groups you may be able to just share some of the things you just learned hey we wanted to uh, thank our partner here with the uh with uh with the town hall academy how much paper have you touched today that's an important question are those piles of time uh, stacked up all over the shop. Well, think of what you could do with that time. And then again, how many more cars you could get through the door? Cha-ching! It's time for a digital shop management system. Many of you need to upgrade on the web at getshopware.com. Hey, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, and thanks. Hey, next week's Town Hall Academy, we're going to talk about second in command, a COO, Chief Operating Officer's perspective. You may look at that as the general manager of your business. Both of the guys that are coming on the show are GMs or COOs in their respective company. One thing I want to share with you all is I did an episode with Kareem Morsley, and it was all about a total management commitment to training. Now, we're talking about the culture of training in this one. But I really need to encourage you to go and listen to Kareem's episode. This is, if you will, a bookend to many of the episodes we have done on training. And, and one more thing. I have, uh, in fact, I think uh, we have a friend. Uh, David, I think you know Carl Sabuco, right? Yeah, I do. I just I talked to him on the phone yesterday. <laughs> Great. Well, he says to me, he wrote, he writes this in, in, um, in Facebook about the show today. He says, this is a challenging subject and is complex with different ages in shops, different upbringing of senior techs and how they get trained and knowing the profile of your team as well as the owner's objective. And that was his take on what we're going to talk about today. So let's let's jump in this, Dave. Uh, thank you very much for bringing the topic to us. Yeah. I, I want to talk about the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room, in my mind, let's get this right up front, is paying for training. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I, I have a unique perspective on an auto repair shop and, and cash flow and that. And in my mind, I've always thought that I personally have never paid for training for any of my employees. In fact, I never paid my parts bills. I never paid my rent. I never paid my employees. My customers all did. And so when I came up from that perspective, I realized that training is one of the number one customer benefits that we can be at. And the most, to me, the most moral ethical thing you can do is be profitable. So you can't afford the training that actually your customers want you to have. 
your employees want you to have it so that they have a longevity of a career and they've always stay relevant in their career. You know, if, if, yeah, I, I want to talk about onboarding employees. And if I was a if I was a technician, guys, and I was going to work at your place and literally training and the culture of your business was critically important to me. I uh, I'm not looking for a job in, a, in another hobby thing. I'm looking for a career. Do you guys hear from technicians that they are looking to and, and ask you questions? How often do you train? Do you have any hours? Do you pay for training? Are we hearing that today? Absolutely. Absolutely. I recently just hired a guy from a GM dealership because they promised training and uh, he was unable to get it from them. And so um, we, we expect 45 hours a year of training, whether it's personal development, um, you know, um, RV or mechanical. That's interesting, guys, that a GM dealer wouldn't be providing training. Have you heard that? Well, as a former GM fixed operations manager, there were seasons where we poured into training and then there were seasons where um, the budget got a little tight. And so we, I was told by upper management that I had to pull back. And so it may not have been the service manager's issue. It may have been, hey, we didn't sell enough cars up front. We need all the money we can get out of service. So there's a lot of things in a dealership environment that could create that. Yeah. There's always a story behind the story, isn't there? It, it, yeah, hey, there I, is. I want to welcome Brian Bates. He wasn't here <laughs> when we originally did the introduction, but good, glad to have you, Brian, from Eagle technical, Automotive yeah, in a Col Columbine Hins, Colorado, multi-shop owner, three stores in the Littleton, Colorado. Are they, are they all in Littleton, Brian? Yeah, yeah, they they are, and actually, um, we just uh, added on two more stores um, in April, and we've got a a sixth store that we're going to add on, um, I believe, in September. So, wow. yeah, we're uh, we're growing pretty good right now. I know somebody who is being aggressive. They're ready. They're going into their second, and within a year, they already have a negotiation going for their third. I am impressed with some shop owners. Um, passion to grow brian uh listen i'd love to do an episode with you to tell me this evolution uh, i have three now i have five and we're adding a sixth that's aggressive congrats i guess oh well thanks yeah yeah my my wife is uh um still with me so that's a, a measure of success <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> that's another whole metric to track right <laughs> yeah we've been happily married for five years and the other 25 years you know are just kind of a little little somewhere in the middle there <laughs> so yeah it, 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 as long as the boss is on board brian you could do yeah. anything you want right yeah so let's talk but, about hiring the right people brian you know, I, and, and it kind of uh, hit me when Dave was talking about the GM, um, him being a fixed operations manager at the dealership and whatnot. And and to me, it really boils down to where your heart is, right? The, yeah. A lot of dealers, um, they're checking a box and uh, they really do pour into training if they have, uh, if the manufacturer says, hey, you don't have enough uh, qualified and trained certified technicians, then that's when they focus on it. And for me, it really boils down to having having the right heart and the heart really boils down to um, hiring people that want to grow. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're a company that wants to grow and uh, it, and if you don't want to grow as a company, um, you know, that's a, that's a bad sign. So everybody should be looking to grow in some way, right? Even if you're not looking to grow at the bottom line, growing qualitatively, growing within the community, growing, um, you know, just, just personal growth um, and being better people, right. you know, learn, learning what our fullest potential is in every area of our lives. And that's really when I'm looking at, um, a, at a candidate, that's what I'm really looking for, because generally speaking, um, we've either vetted whether they can do the, the job that we need them to do or not. Um, but really what, it, you know, what, what we try to do is make sure that instead of putting out fires, that the fires never occur. And one of the fires that do occur or that does occur um, is the training fire. Uh, we, we don't have people that are attending training they're not developing themselves they're they're not growing and um very quickly in today's climate in the automotive industry um you become irrelevant mm -hmm. and um and and so struggling with 
that is a is a, is a fire that has to be put out at some point and um that versus somebody that you hire on and they say man i really want to grow i really want to have um ha have a place that that is training people because i want to learn more and more about my profession and and i'm in it i'm a professional and i'm committed to this industry those are the people that I, I feel like are, are really easy to to bring on board. One of my uh, favorite um, sayings is, you know, Lou Holtz said, hey, I've, I've coached bad players and I've coached good players before. And frankly, when I have better players, I'm a better coach. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and I have pulled my hair out from having some uh, some people on the team that I, I, I think back and go, man, I missed something when, when I brought them on board. And, and, and you I just you work. you just said subtraction, um, uh, uh, no addition by subtraction. That's what you just said, <laughs> right? And, and, and you know we've done shows on we we just hang on there a little too long to some people because they they weren't right. fitting, they weren't right. But let me ask a really important question: uh, training. You just said it. You know, are they being trained? Are they being trained? Is it? Are we pulling training from the bottom, or are we pushing training from the leadership aspect? And this whole show is about that culture. Are, is the leader of the company critical to saying, I'm going for business management training, I'm going for marketing training, and here is the training I'm recommending. Are you keeping a resume on training for your people? Are you involved in any kind of learning management system that attracts this? Are we doing assessments pre and post? Because just checking the box and paying for a seminar doesn't mean that, right. they, that the communications got through, it will not help your business if they're just checking a box. Exactly. Well, and I, I think also um, when you're, I, I've had people that I've sent to some very expensive training that um, thought it was great training and, and didn't apply it. Um, and, and so you're kind of hitting the nail on the head there, Carm, is that it has to be applied. But in order for it to be applied, it has to be something that's relevant to um, who who you're sending to the training and the best way to find that out is to ask them where do they want to grow um in the industry where do they want i love brian um holty that he says hey it doesn't have to be technical training we're talking about personal growth training right. any any sort of development where you invest in yourself over a time period um and and when we really look in and dig into that and review that is during our quarterly reviews and our quarterly reviews are very little about numbers i mean my feeling is they get a review every other week right. when they get a paycheck and they can see the numbers and we go over those numbers as a, as a team but um when we're having quarterly reviews it it is more based on hey where are you right now in your career? Where do you want to go? How are you going to get there? How can we help? Where are your frustrations? Um, where are you gaining traction? And then um, setting a plan together um, that, that we help them and they help themselves, all that sort of um, kind of, you know, symbiotic relationship there. And then in three months, let's, let's come together and let's talk about it again. And that really gives us the opportunity to connect to them as a person as well. And to really, you know, um, create that, that good relationship um, with the team and make sure that they know that we, you know, that, that hopefully to build that trust and let them know that we care about them and that we want to help them. And that's really the foundation for any sort of, uh, you know, relationship that you have with people on your team. They want to know they can trust you. They want to know you care and they want to know that you can help them. So with that, with that in mind, to get to that point where you're doing the review and back to Carm's question, what are we doing for onboarding? And, you know, Brian, both Brian's, um, what are some of the things during the interview process? What do you, asking them, sharing with, how do you draw out that you found somebody who's naturally wired that wants the training? And if in the interview process, you don't sense they're into training, what do you do with that person? They may have all the, you know, everything else that you want as a top producer, but if they're not into training, that's a usually the resume show every two to three years are bouncing around. That's another indicator of a resume that bounces around like that. But, but what are some of the things you practical things that you do to, um, to attract that, that person who wants training? First thing I do uh, is I just ask him, I says, how do you feel about training? What, it, what's important to you about training? If, if it's not important to them, then that kind of gives me the answer right there. But if, if it is, they're going to tell you, 
where areas they want to be trained in and you can help guide them along if uh, I'm I'm looking for people that uh, have more interest in EV and so I'll ask if they've ever done that had the experience are you interested in in that area and and they're going to tell you right up whether or not they are right I, I would agree with Brian is is calling that out and being you know very uh, upfront about it and straightforward is is really instrumental um i would also say that we don't necessarily look at a, a training mentality as as much as a growth mentality yeah and so really some of the questions we ask is how do you stay on top of um, the the latest technology in the industry whether they're service mm -hmm. advisor or technician how do you um how, what what's the last book that you read that's a man that's a fascinating yeah, that's a question one. we had a guy um tell us one time that the last book he read was the iliad and uh and, and my general manager said uh well it's it's much better in its native language if you you know ever get a chance to read it in greek <laughs> <laughs> ancient greek um but th th those are and because you got to be careful because there are a lot of ways that people learn and sitting inside of a classroom um, right. being instructed to is not necessarily the uh, the best way for people to learn. So we, we, we've had people say that, you know, I do this or I have friends and I'm on chat forums and, and they're really immersed in learning, but it's not in a classroom setting. So you really have to open your mind and say, okay, does this person have a growth mentality even if he doesn't have a training, you know, classroom sort of mentality, because those could be the right people. And so then we really, really, we do really dig into how are you growing as a person? What sort of, you know, plan do you have? What are your aspirations? Um, and then you can really dig into, um, I, I love, there's a book called uh, the, uh, the Ideal Team Player by Patrick Lencioni. And he says, um, he really likes looking for people that are humble, hungry, smart, and yeah. the smart is the emotional intelligence, not the uh, IQ, not the, uh, the, the intelligence uh, quotient. And so the, when, when we dig into that, we're, as a person, we're really looking for that humble, hungry, smart. And a lot of that has to go with, um, with the training, because if they're not humble, then they don't feel like they should be growing. But if they do have, you know, mm -hmm. a, a good sense of humility, they realize that, hey, look, I'm I'm in a good spot right now, but I know that, you know, I'm not the, the perfect person that I could be. And I need to continue to grow because I'm driven to grow as a person. You know, you both, you know, Brian and both Brian's have spoke to the personal development side of things. One of the questions I encourage shop owners or who's ever doing the interview process is to ask the question, When's the last time you invested in you to be a better version of you? And mm -hmm. give me an experience of that. And it's amazing how many people don't even focus on that. Um, and that leads a doorway to knowing a little bit about more about the individual as well. The, the other realm, and as you talked about, you know, uh, going to training and coming back, what do they do? They, they didn't implement it. One of the things I learned actually in the dealership when I worked at a dealership where we had 26 technicians and when I became shop foreman, one of the things that I implemented was, was when the techs came back or advisors came back, anybody came back from a training, we had a shop meeting and they had to bring three of the top three takeaways. And I teed it up before they left. By the way, when you come back, you're going to give the three top takeaways that we can implement and put in place um, right away. What I find out really interesting is that a lot of shop owners, when we do, a, we have a unique style of advisor training and that advisor training, they go, I'm going to put this young person through it. And I say, OK, we can do that. But here's what I see happen all the time. You put that young advisor into some elevated advisor training that your other advisors haven't had. They come back and try to implement it and they get shut down. And now they're like, well, why do I even go to training? I don't even want to go to training because they're going to override anything I do anyway. And so if the culture there is not receiving of somebody that's learned something new, whether it's a fit or not, um, you still need to let them have the voice, let their training experience be a positive experience when they come back into the the team right I, i'd agree with you dave I, I i've learned 
many years ago that that same lesson is that if you only send one person to the training that it that it does have a very short shelf life because everybody in the company everybody in the store needs to be bought in and uh and, and has to be um educated on where you want the company to go including the owner so um if if you're looking at some very high high level training for your service advisor and your manager if you don't know what that training is or if you can't um, walk that walk as well then uh, there's the, the, the law of the lid right is those people are only going to grow to the ele- yeah. to the level that you are as a leader and if uh, and if you don't understand what they're trying to accomplish then uh, then they don't have the environment to uh, take that um, training to its fullest potential so one, one of the things that we've done at our business development group is um, when we do training we um if we have a class we, we actually give a package for three people in the company instead of just an individual package so we'll we'll sell a, a class for two hundred dollars or fifty dollars or whatever um whatever we decide the price is going to be but we make sure that everybody knows that's for three people in um for a ticket for good for three people in the shop and if more people want to show up, then we calculate what the food cost is and we um, charge them for food because that's generally, you know, the, the, the only right. expense at that point. The seats are already paid for. So um, so it gets more people into the into the class. So somebody that's trying to make a decision on how many people do I send? It, it's not a financial decision. It's more of a are they bought into and do they want it decision? And one of the things that rewards, you know, the training to keep it going is rewarding that and i know brian holty you and i've worked together for quite a bit of years now working on an incentive plan that works and and i love how you described it you know is is it it is a journey you Absolutely. put something in place and so many shop owners before they do something they want to have this perfection before they set it going and so they end up waiting their whole life for perfection to show up and <laughs> just get something going. So Brian, if you could talk a little bit about what are some of the incentivized things that you've done in your shop that perpetuates training? Hey uh, guys, I want to stop you for a minute. Okay. Dave, do me a favor. Remember that question. It's a great one. Okay. And uh, we're going to take a, we're going to take a really quick ba- break and come back for segment B. Thanks again to awesome. our partner Shopware. Every piece of paper you touch, you know, adds up to seconds, minutes, and hours of your staff's time. So get paper out of your business and unlock your employees' potential with Shopware's digital shop management software on the web at getshopware.com. Okay, I got to stop for a moment and say this. Uh, Brian, you brought up, uh, you brought up humble hungry and smart right do you know brian kelly absolutely i do from I don't. okay well we did a show on employee reviews from brian kelly uh, up at um, valley auto electric in covington washington uh chairman of the asa northwest group and he talks it's all about hungry humble and smart and when they do their reviews their quarterly reviews that's the guidelines that they use now, in Patrick Lencioni's book on my books page on the website, my that book is there. So if anyone wants to go out and get that book or at least find out something about it, you can find it on our books page. Because every time we mention a book on this show, I put it up there so that everyone has a, has a reference to go to. So thank you so much for that. Now, Dave, I'll let you go back back to that question for Brian. Yeah, so part of training, again, is is not only creating the culture, for, but inside of that culture. And I like... Um, Brian Bates is, you know, it, it's more about growth than it is just training is one element of growth. And that so when we create a culture of growth, so to speak, it's it's all encompassing. But part of that is perpetuating it. And in that perpetuating it, keeping consistency with it as well. And Brian Holty has gone to some great lengths to build some incentive plans that um, really do that. And Brian, if you could talk to that, that'd be awesome. Well, it's just one of the things that uh, I've done is um, I I incentivize it by having the 45 hours of training a year. That kind of gets them the into the ability to earn bonuses based upon the number of certificates they've got. And it's a it one of the challenges is it can get kind of complex. But um, my I uh, a ASE Master Tech 
can earn up to three dollars an hour bonus for every sold hour and and that's based on production efficiency and um his attendance etc so the the program is developed so that it they have a desire to be there they want the training so that they can be better at what they do so they can flag more hours and it it makes them better at their job and um the and, and it pays them to to meet all those requirements is there any pushback when you sit down with someone and say hey coming to work for us it's great you got to do 45 hours you know i have not had anybody um give me a pushback on on an hours of training and and we do strive to make sure that training's available for every person whether it's it's online training um i have set into my e-time i'm sure everybody knows uh, many shops have e-time but uh a tech can be paid um, e-time for um, doing training during the day, or he can do it after hours. And is, all he's got to do is turn in a pass certificate for a class. If it's a three-hour class, he gets paid three hours. If it's a two-hour class, he gets two hours. All he's got to do is turn in the pass certificate. And we have to assume and trust that he took the class and um, got information and then took the test and passed it. So I guess if I was sitting down with someone and we were interviewing to come to work in our place that has a very huge and important training culture, culture overall, but, mm -hmm. but training is right up there. And I say, by the way, let's talk about some of the, some of the must have, some of the, you know, non-negotiables. And that is the 45 hour of training per, per year. And I'll give you a little idea of how that works and what you can do. And they say, well, well, um, can I do 30? Do you hire that person? Well, I haven't had that occasion, but I would say probably not because if they're going to ask for to only do 30, they probably don't want to do any. Okay, so I it think, would um, how you do one thing's how you do everything. Right. That's almost an altruistic statement, but if they're going to settle compromise, not play a big game in training, they're not going to play a big game in production and their the way they show up on the team. It, it, their their desire for training is really desire for growth whether it's Absolutely. personal development or your career um, and, and that. And so if they're going to play a small game there, they're going to play a small game in everything they do, including working on Mr. and Mrs. Jones's car. And when we're talking about high-tech vehicles now with so many safety issues that could potentially be there, I don't want my techs or, or techs that I coach now, I don't want them playing a small game. We can't survive in this industry anymore to play a mediocre um, uh, small game. We've got to play that big game if we're going to stand out and have a livelihood. You know, one of the things is it's about, you know, we help, we have an onboarding package where we help shops bring on top performers. One of the languages that we use is a great lifetime earning uh, potential that you'll have because we're, we're selling a lifetime. We're not selling a job with a paycheck week to week. We're selling a lifetime career and you want your language to attract that, including even elevating instead of just paid training, paid training with bonuses like in Brian's in Brian's case there. And it could be consistency too. hey, you know, what? 45 hours a year. Um, but we're going to break that down into a quarter. And if you consistently hit the each quarter's goal and you do that for the whole year, not only the 45, but you didn't just do it the last quarter of the year, the last month to go get your bonus. You did it consistently throughout the year. Then you re have a bonus or reward for a consistency bonus. And, there, you know, we do, we talk about that with sold hours and weekly hours or monthly hours or quarterly hours. You, you reward what it is that you want. And there's a phrase out there. I love this phrase. It's uh, that which you want, create the space for what you want to actually exist. And some of that comes from the incentive plan. And sometimes, and I'm finding this with a lot of, of especially the younger generation, it's not so much money. It might be just time off. Hey, if you do a certain amount of training, it might be, you know, a day off paid or, you know, here's here's an extra five hundred dollars when you go on vacation to help pay for your gas or your room. Um, and that there's a lot of different incentive ways to do that. Dave, I got to ask you a question. Uh, how many techs? You, you, you know, shop owners, you know, techs, they want a paid structured training program because the goalposts move every day and if they don't stay up and on it they're going to atrophy 
I mean, do, all right, techs, I, I'll bet you there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of them out there working in our industry that want this so bad, but either their owners aren't giving it to them or they don't know how to ask because the open lines of communications aren't there. Yeah, it's funny. We talked about, you know, Carlo posted beforehand and Carlo and I, we were having a conversation in that. And one of the things is the age of the technician. And so I'm seeing that like some A plus level techs now, I mean, they're they're in their 50s and some of them are kind of done training. They're almost in a little bit of a retirement mode for the next 10 years or so or 15 years that they've got left. And so some of that has edged away. They've and part of that is a culture they were in didn't keep training exciting the whole length of their career. See, I don't think they can coast. Do you? Brian, what do you think? They want to, but I, I, I have one tech that fits that, uh, that fits that bill. And, and um, it's, it's difficult. It's something you just have to keep, you know, nudging them along. And, and um, it's, you know, I'm tired. I, I, I ache. I don't want to do it, you know, and, and I already know all this, but the, the technology is changing. And if they can't keep up with that, then, then they're, they're, um, it, it can't just be seniority. It, Brian it has Bates, to be with, with the number of shops that you have, and obviously the number of techs that you have working for you, what's your take on that? Yeah, you know, um, First of all, I, I don't think there's a one one size fits all. And I think that's where a lot of companies that do grow, especially to multiple locations, they do try to make streamline things and make them efficient. And um, and you really lose that personal um, you, creativity and approach customization to each person's individual training. And I love Dave's uh, um, thoughts as far as incentivizing um, technicians and, and service advisors everybody on your team should be incentivized uh you know my cfo is incentivized to to do training as well the uh the 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 thing about it is what what are they looking for and there's an interesting um there, there's an interesting guy back in the 50s he did some studies on industrial psychology and he he talked about these two things that that really um separate and it's a it's it's a great uh it's a great probably full two hour podcast, but basically what he found was that after people are happy with their environment, then they, they look for uh, more qualitative things. And, and that can come in the form of, um, of recognition, increased responsibility, achievement, um, meaningful work, all those sorts of things. And so really, to me, it, the, the compensation for that is more of a recognition and that recognition can come in a bunch of different forms right. and, uh, and the achievement is in there as well. So when you go back to how do you, um, how do you get people excited about training, you, you start feeding into that process where um, the regular reviews become, you know, a, a, a core of that. Hiring becomes a core. Onboarding is, is a core of that because everything kind of dovetails into each other. So so when you're talking about training, you relate it back to those, you know, those things that that they are looking for to feed their yeah. soul, right? I mean, you're really talking about after you've fed their their being, um, you know, yeah. physically they've got security. Now, how do you feed their soul? And achievement is mm -hmm. a big part of that. And having that connection and, and understanding those those. Uh, what they want to achieve and how that aligns with what you want to achieve as a company is extremely important. And that's different for everybody in your company, although you can probably put them in a few different groups. And I'm, I'm are, sorry. Are you Go talking ahead. about, are you talking about Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs? No, no, this is okay. a Hertzberg's uh, two factor theory. It's a guy that built on Maslow, but it's a, it's fascinating and it's, and it's just gold when you look at um, how do you motivate people um, with, you know, with who they are and what they want as a person. And, um, and, and, and again, everything feeds into this. So if you know what their goals are and if their goals don't align with your goals, and that kind of goes back to the question of if they don't want to train, do you still hire them? Well, no, because we want to grow as a company and, and they don't want to grow as a person. Well, then that's going to be at odds with each other during the whole time that they're working with you until it becomes frustrating and you have to ask them to leave.
So how are we going to deal with the uh, the A plus techs that uh, Brian Holthy, I think you said that are in their uh, oh, slumber years. I don't know, 50, <laughs> 55, or was it you, Dave, who said that? Yeah. How are we going to sit down with them and say, um, you haven't been to training in a few years and it doesn't look like you want to and look at all that we're doing and you know our commitment in our culture on training. Mm. Um, can, can I help you get up and over this blockage that you have? Some of that, if I can address that, in the onboarding process, we have a unique what we call enhanced job description. And part of it is that at the bottom of the job description, actually, I'll say this, the job description talks about character traits, behavioral traits, their, um, some of their, their interests, their passions. And it also talks about um, training and what that spells out in the job description. And at the bottom, it says, I am one, I am committed to fulfilling, meeting or exceeding the above expectations around the duties, responsibilities and training with that. I am committed to that. And now when somebody doesn't want to train or they don't do the task on the, the job description, uh, my encouragement is don't point out where they failed, point to their commitment. And that's where you come to them. And that's leading by commitment versus command. And when you lead by commitment, then you say, hey, you know, Bill, um, you know, you, I know you to be a man of your word and you gave your word and commitment that you were committed to training. And I've noticed that the last two or three classes you've turned down to go. Some of those legitimate excuses you had uh, something else that night you'd already planned. I, I get that, but it seems like it's more of a pattern now. And I know you're a man of your commitment. W what are some other things that are maybe getting in the way of your commitment that you had around training? And now I'm having a heart to heart conversation. I'm having it around a commitment and not pointing out a failure in his life. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Same with sold hours, GPs, hours prepared. And that, I mean, how many GP conversations can you have with somebody? Some, most advisors don't need another round of GP training. What they need is they need to be addressed what's holding their commitment level down. And when you go break through that glass ceiling, watch the GPs soar. Right. I'd, I'd, I'd like to build on that as well, Dave, is, is that, you know, um, when you're looking at the context behind why is the, the training important? And that's what I always ask myself, what, what does this mean in context to who we are as a company and the purpose of the company and, and who do I want to be as a business owner and hiring the right people? And so um, when you really look at that training for us, our, our purpose of the company is to make people's lives better. And our mission is to grow our company so that we can make more people's lives better as we grow as a company and, and make the community better. Awesome. Then when you start looking at the commitments, the commitments are, are generally based on when we hired somebody, we hired them because they enjoy making other people's lives better. And that's why they really enjoy working on cars. Um, we've interviewed people where we say, what got you, why do you love this industry? What, what, what do you like about um, working on cars and just the people that are in this industry and whatnot. And if they don't really have a good answer for that, and that it's all about, well, I just love making money and turning hours or whatnot. We know that that's probably not going to be a deep enough reason for them to work with our company. And so when we have somebody that we brought on board and they said, Hey, I love helping people. I love making people's lives better. I love how I can do that with, you know, by working on cars or by selling the work on cars. And then we have an issue with training and, and we then we can start not not only relating it back to their commitment as a, as a person and the, being a person of their word but also what that means for them as you know as being true to what their passion is and what they enjoy doing and, and what their commitment was to come to the company and where the company is going and we say hey look you're you're wanting to make people's lives better the training keeps us relevant and keeps us on on the cutting edge and at the top so that we're doing the best and serving our customers the best plus it allows you to achieve and earn you know the, the sort of living that you're earning and, and be true to the people in your personal lives now let's talk about how training affects that and if you stop training and growing as a person then all those commitments that you've made to the the, the team members to us as a company and to your personal um, commitments of family and friends and, and community, maybe, you know, if they're spiritual, even, you know, to, to their God, then all of a sudden training becomes more meaningful right. and it really digs in deep to their soul versus just saying, Hey, look, you know, this was a commitment and uh, now you're going to have to do it or you're going to look silly. Right. Yeah, that's that's well spoken. Very good. Yeah, well spoken into that. Well, thank you. Hey, let's uh, let's let's pick up on that in a minute, 
uh, and come back for segment C. Hey, when was the last time you heard a customer say, thank you for taking my money? Hmm. Get software, shop management software, and your customers will be shouting it from the rooftops in overwhelming five-star reviews. Learn all, all about it and learn more at getshopware.com on the web. My brain hurts. <laughs> You know, as, as, as Brian was talking, if I could interject real quick, getting down to the heart and the core of somebody, even the, the realm and a lot of in the industry, we don't really want to talk about the spiritual aspect, but there is a, we're spiritual beings and there is an aspect to that. And we, we need to nurture that in a way that's self, self serving that particular person. One of the ways that I believe that, um, that we can do that is some people have a gift of teaching that's part of their spirit that's what they were created with and so in part of uh keeping training alive is that is having a mentor and in-house training versus a not outhouse training but outside training <laughs> <laughs> but but have you know when you bring somebody on board they can be all this commitment stuff about training and the, and the rest but when they get on board nobody trained them in their position even if they're an a-level tech they need you know, partner them up. Carlo does a good job of this. He, they have a an, an onboarding buddy, so to speak, for a certain period of time that shows them the rhythm of the shop and teaches them about the culture of the shop. And they put somebody that does that who's naturally gifted with that. And so, when you not only training that they're giving, but training or that they're receiving, but training that they're actually giving back into the team is a great way to build mentorship. And mentorship is not just training, it's investing in that person. It's it's somebody being a coach, an in-house coach, so to speak, um, that that once you train something, it goes in here, right? It's logical, it's a methodology, it's a process. And then, but you, if they didn't get it, if you feed it one more time, does that mean they're gonna get it? No, now you need somebody who knows the gift of coaching, which is more, the best coaches ask questions. We don't, if you keep giving statements, you're a trainer. If you keep giving the how to, you're a trainer. And a lot of our coaches in our industry, um, and there's some really good trainers in the industry, some of them are calling themselves coaches, and they just repeat the, regurgitate the training over and over again, but they don't coach to the result. And that's the, that's the difference of a true coach. And so having somebody inside your organization who you've invested in being a coach, being a, you know, a technician coach, being an advisor coach, a manager coach, um, HR coach, it's just a huge, it adds so much to your, a culture of growth or a culture of training. I, I, you know, um, I, I love listening to John Maxwell. Um, mm. And so there's a lot of that that goes in there. And, uh, um, he, you know, he says that, well, one, one thing that I'd like to build on, on that, Dave, is that people go through three phases of their life, and sort of businesses. Um, there's a survival phase, there's a success right. phase, and there's a significance phase. And looking at your company, there's probably somebody in each one of those phases in your company. So knowing that somebody's survival is important to them gives you the opportunity to serve them that way. Their success, moving them to success. When somebody's going from success to significance, being a mentor and mentoring that as well is really important. And one of the things that John Maxwell talks about a lot is um, is climbing ladders, right? And ladders. Um, and he says, you know, hey, look, your, your first step is to climb the ladder. And the second step is to hold the ladder for the next person and the third step is to build the ladders right and uh, mm -hmm. and as um as business owners our job is to be leaders and leaders mean you know being a true leader means that you do have um people that you're helping them to grow and that you're 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 mentoring them and as you're mentoring them and your company grows then those people should be taught to mentor other people and to grow leaders so really our you know the the purpose of leadership is not to to lead as much it is as it is to build more leaders and that 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 really ties into this whole training thing right and the training um in my mind is is again not a training idea but a, a real growth mentality and when you're when your company has a growth culture, then training just becomes a natural part of that. And when you find people that are that are really tuned into that and love that and and, and eat it up, 
those people tend to tend to stay with your company and become very loyal, but you have to feed that. Um, if they're if they're not interested in that and they feel like this is an annoyance, then generally speaking, they're going to weed themselves out. And sometimes we have to help mm-hmm. them along that journey. <laughs> but <laughs> but the the idea is that if if you know if if it's true that you're either growing or dying, then you want to grow. And in order to grow, that means that you have to mentor and help other people grow in your business. And uh, and the more you grow true leaders, then then that becomes multiplied. And then those leaders then grow the people that are working that you cannot touch. And uh, and and you know you you want to impact people, not impress them. Right? Im- impacting is when you touch somebody's heart. Impressing them right. is what you do from a distance. And so truly impacting those people that you can spend time with and impacting them in a way that they can pass that along to the people that are with them. And, and then that becomes an encouragement of, Hey, grow yourself, right? Start climbing this ladder and taking this journey of growth and then showing them how to do that and showing them the paths and giving them the tools to do that. And I think truly when you're looking at, you know, the mountaintop karm, that becomes the ideal situation where you have people um, that really, it's in it's in their their soul and and they're driven to grow and they're looking for places to grow and that may not be a textbook that may not be sitting in training that may not be um you know doing doing traditional routes but when you have those quarterly reviews then you talk about how did you grow over the last three months and and uh and did i help you and did we do our part to to help create that environment what can we do better and what's the next step and where do we keep on going and um and, and so you know we 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 strive for that ideal kind of mountaintop um constantly and for me that's that's the ideal place and and do we miss quarterly reviews absolutely you know do we do we you know sometimes have people on board that are not you know growth driven yeah you know we're not a perfect company but i i believe you know that you 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 shoot for perfection you land on excellence right Right. and uh and that's in my mind that that's my true goal and we have tons of people in our in our company that they are just just driven to grow you know brian holty you met chris a couple weeks ago that's one of my store managers and that Mm -hmm. guy is just a sponge and he's in his 20s and he's running the top store in our company and he's going to do probably two and a half million dollars this year last year he did 1.8 and he's just growing 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 and every time i talk to him you can just see that his his eyes light up he's open to criticism and he uh you know he thanks me every time i give him suggestions instead of getting defensive and and those are you know those are those people on your team where you're just like yeah that's 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 the 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 mentality that i'm looking for and you you keep um you know making sure that you're pouring into other people so that you bring that out of them as well wow um guys i have to tell you i'm i'm moved by uh, this discussion here today it went beyond places that i thought it would go um to put a bow on what i've heard and i'll give each of you a, a final comment uh, John Maxwell, my favorite leadership author. I've got a ton of his books listed up and on the books page on the RemarkableResults.biz website. I'm doing a series with Mike Davidson, who is a certified John Maxwell trainer and coach, also a shop owner. And we've published three of them so far. We have two more to publish. And, I, I you know, lead, everything rises and falls on leadership. Leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And so many of us in this industry have done great things to become better leaders, and some of us haven't. And maybe part of the great message here is it starts at the top, Brian. And and, and so I, I learned this. It was, we could go on for two hours, and, and maybe we should come back and do a second part It's up to you guys, but let's go around the room. Any final comments on this great episode about, uh, you know, creating a training culture? I'll start with you, Brian Holthy. You know, it is just um, first. The first thing that I've done is I've tried to make sure that I keep training for myself. It's uh, whether it's it's in uh, the 20 group, whether it's uh, coaching or um, listening to books, ebooks. I try to keep myself trained and that way that I can pass it on and my team sees that I'm trying to grow. That sets the example so that they I'm not asking them to do things that uh, that 
I'm not doing myself. And, and I think that by leading by example, that helps. And, and, um, and then trying to be there to answer questions and to encourage uh, when they are growing or when they're struggling and, and help them find ways to grow. Well said, Brian Bates. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think to, to sum up, you know, my, my, you know, core thoughts of it is, is really, you need to define who you are as a company and what your purpose is. Um, why are you in business and then find people that align with those values and, and, uh, and that purpose. And for us, you know, we have four core values of, of our company and one of them is individual and collective growth. And that becomes a non-negotiable um, for hiring people. And it's a non-negotiable if you're on the team and you're not walking out those values. And, uh, and, and you know, having those um, four values that we hold highest and a purpose for the company really makes it easy to, to tie into when somebody isn't um, walking the walk. Um, tie it back into something that's a higher higher meaning than um, hey this is this is a requirement of your job and you're either going to do it or or you're out of here. Thank you so much, Dave. Shadeen, uh, Dave, I tell you, there are some incredible leaders in our great automotive mm -hmm. aftermarket, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I could listen to both brands for for quite a while. In fact, every shop I go to, um, as I coach, I go with the anticipation of learning something new. And whether it's from a, a junior apprentice tech, which up in Toronto, I had this, this aha moment um, about differential fluid. And this he was changing this pristine, clean looking fluid. And I said, well, you know, the fluid looks pretty clean. Are you sure it needed to be done in that? And he says, oh yeah, because when I, when I road tested the vehicle and, he, and then he says it this way, he goes, as you know, when you check differential fluid, you have only three to five minutes to check it to see if the if it's foaming up. Otherwise, the foam goes away and it looks pristine, but the anti-foaming agent went away and you don't know that. And I looked at him and went, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. <laughs> you know, here I've been coaching in master level tech and never thought of the phrase, when do you check differential fluid? With a low? So all that to say is stay open to training, stay open to growth, stay open to that to the point where... When I went through personal development, uh, my first year that I really saw what I needed to do to take myself as a coach up higher and what my clients expect is a high level coach, I have to invest in myself. My first year, I invested well over $50,000 in personal development. And then on average now, every year, it's five to $7,000 of personal development that I put into myself, both my wife and I, because we want to play a bigger game. And if we stop playing a bigger game, I've set the context when I start coaching for them, it's okay for them to not play a bigger game. Even though nothing ever came out of my mouth, it's just the energy I carry into that coaching session invest in yourself do something for yourself and i'm going to suggest in our industry another round of a mechanism how to make a shop profitable stay on top of that but more importantly be a better version of you be a better bankable version of you wow thank you all so much dave shadeen uh, computech automotive management systems brian holthy genesis automotive and rv tacoma washington and brian bates eagle automotive columbine hills uh five stores now and I, I have changed that from three to five and another one in the incubator. Isn't that cool? Hey, guys, have a great weekend. Thank you so much for your contributions to the Town Hall Academy. Thank you, Carm. It's great to be here. Thanks, Carm.